Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We are very excited to welcome Catherine Fleming Bruce to talk about her book, The Sustainers. Um, before we get to Catherine's introduction, if you've made your way here and are not familiar with the Preservation League, um, my name is Katie Peace. I'm the Director of Communications for the League. We are a New York statewide nonprofit focused on investing in people and projects that champion the essential role of preservation and community revitalization, sustainable economic growth, and the protection of our historic buildings and landscapes. We do this through lots of different programming, including technical services, grants, including our signature grant programs that we offer through the New York State Council on the Arts. Our Preserve New York grants are open right now for anyone looking for funding. Uh, our seven to save list of endangered historic sites, which we will be announcing later this spring. Our Excellence in Historic Preservation Awards, public policy and advocacy that we do at the local, state, and federal levels, and a variety of online programs like the one you are here with us today for. So we are very excited to welcome Catherine. She um, wrote The Sustainers, uh, Being, Building, and Doing Good Through Activism in the Sacred Spaces of Civil Rights, Human Rights, and Social Movements, which received the 2017 Historic Preservation Book Prize from the University of Mary Washington Center for Historic Preservation. I originally found out about this book through her interview with Preservation Maryland's PreserveCast podcast, and I knew that I wanted to invite her to be part of the League's Preservation Book Club. And I was very excited when I cold emailed her and she was down to join us. Um, the Sustainers was named one of the 15 essential African-American history books by the National Trust for Historic Preservation in 2017. In addition to her writing, Catherine has been involved in many grassroots preservation projects and is currently working on the restoration of the Cyril O. Span Medical Office in Columbia, South Carolina. The Cyril O. Span Medical Office is part of a new vaccine hesitancy project, including museums and libraries called Victory Through COVID-19 Vaccines with South Carolina Black Heroes in Medicine, which is funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences and the CDC, which is a very interesting project. Um, Catherine is going to be giving a talk today about the sustainers and um, once she is finished with her presentation she'll be joined by my colleague Katie Eckers Como the league's vice president for policy and preservation. Uh, the two of them will have a conversation and Katie will also work through any questions that come in from our audience so if you have a question while Catherine is speaking please drop it in the Q&A box. I'll be man monitoring the chat so if there are any things that Catherine mentions that I can quickly drop a link for I will do so there but if you have a question, um, please put it in the Q&A and Katie will get to as many of those questions as possible. This webinar is being recorded, so if you can't tune in for the whole thing or if you just want to share it with someone after the fact, uh, it will be on our YouTube channel uh, probably tomorrow and then also on our website. If you are viewing this on our YouTube channel, thank you very much. Like and subscribe. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand things over to Catherine. So Catherine, take it away. Hello everyone, so glad to be here. So glad to have people still having a wonderful interest in my book. I wrote it in 2015, 2016. It received the award in 2017. And from there, uh, I was able to participate in a number of forums. And now there is a renewed opportunity for interest because of all of the dialogue that's going on around history in schools and how it's to be presented uh, and the debate that's going on. So I feel that once again, um, we preservationists are in the spotlight uh, and, and some might even say in the crosshairs of how we are able to engage and continue to make sure that our work is valued for the critical piece that it plays in a number of arenas. So I want to start briefly by talking about why I wrote the book and how it came together. Uh, then I want to show you some of the pictures from some of the work that I've been doing over time. Uh, and some of this work has been the subject of some uh, research that has looked at how Black women are um, presented publicly and how our works have, how our houses, uh, historic homes and other sites have been preserved uh, and how we were able to be a part of that uh, history making effort in our, in our county. 
So to start off with, my book was the result of my own experiences as a preservationist. Uh, it started with the work that I did on the Majeska Monte Simpkins house. But after that house, after that work was done, the preservation was done, an anniversary was coming up, uh, an opportunity for uh, Birmingham, Alabama to celebrate uh, its 50th anniversary of uh, civil rights activity. So 1963 was the year that they focused on and other cities were engaged in that anniversary, including my own city, Columbia, South Carolina. So when, once those cities came together, Memphis, Columbia, Birmingham, uh, Selma, a number of other cities, I wondered about preservation efforts in those cities, specifically, specifically with regard to, specifically with regard to civil rights historic sites. What was the process that they used? What was the uh, result? What was the time frame? Uh, was their experience anything like my own? So once that happened, um, I decided to seek out some of these stories. And often these are not the stories that you will hear when you go to the museums, when you go to the historic sites. You mostly hear about the people that are connected to the building uh, and the significance that they had. But you don't hear the story of how that, that site was saved. And that was the story that I wanted to find out about. So I was able to find a number of those individuals who were behind uh, some of the sites that are very significant to us, the Lorraine Motel, um, the Medgar Evers site. And we pulled those folks together and had a symposium. And after the symposium, I started working on the book and I added um, other uh, preservation stories that were not um, part of the symposium to, to add that out. But I found a number of things in common. Uh, for most of the sites, it took at least a decade uh, for the project to come to fruition. And most of the people who were involved did have an interest in activism. And they were activists themselves and they saw this work from that frame. So, there are three reasons why I wrote this book. The one is the, is the desire to share my experiences with others in the hopes that others might join the uh, preservation enterprise. Second, the desire to expand the definition of preservation to include the activist frame and to say that in many cases, especially in civil rights historic sites, human rights historic sites, the activist work, the, the preservation work is an extension of activism. It's either an extension of the work that that individual connected to the site was doing. It's an extension of the work that people in the future will be able to do because of their knowledge of this individual. And it's also an extension of the individual who is a preservationist and who is bringing that frame into the work. So I wanted to be able to um, do those pieces and make sure that they were in the book. The book is not just for preservationists, it's for the general public. So I wanted to make sure that I wanted to make sure that I was able to have that definition there. So it's not a scholarly book, but it has scholarly elements to it. So from there, I'm going to uh, share my screen with you. I have a set of pictures that I want to show from some of the work uh, that I've been doing over the past couple of years. So I'm going to start with 
um, my first image, and I'm hoping you all can see that. I think uh, Katie will tell me if you can't. But this is a picture of actually uh, one of the first owners of the Vizanska Stark site, Barrett Vizanska. So this is a site that had white, Jewish, and African-American owners. Uh, this is Mrs. Julia Starks. Uh, she was the wife of uh, Dr. J.J. Starks, who is one of the first Black presidents of Benedict College in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, and she and her husband lived in the Vizanska Starks house um, during the 1930s for a brief period before his death, um, because he, he became ill uh, and some of his activities with the college were, were slightly reduced, moved a little bit away from the college, uh, but they lived there during that time period. And here's a picture of Dr. Starks. Um, Dr. Starks was actually president of three colleges, uh, Seneca Institute in the upstate of South Carolina, um, Morris College in Sumter, South Carolina, and finally, Benedict College in Columbia, South Carolina. So he was a significant figure in education um, during that time. Okay. Uh, here's a small picture of the Vizanska Starks house as it appears today. And that's one of the sites that I'm working on. Uh, the next pictures that I want to show are pictures from the Dr. Dr. Cyril Spann site. And one of the, um, one of the historical um, engagements that Dr. Spann was involved in was the Edwards versus South Carolina case. And this was a series of um, uh, this was a, a, a group of young people who protested, college students from several colleges in South Carolina, who protested, protested on South Carolina State House grounds and were arrested, and their cases went to the U.S. Supreme Court. So Dr. Spann was one of the activists, community activists, who supported those students um, helped make sure they got out of jail, make sure their bails uh, were paid, and was very outspoken in defense of their ability to uh, assemble publicly. And the Edwards versus South Carolina case became a landmark case for expression of popular views. Yeah, so this is the recent marker that was placed um, in Columbia to represent those individuals who participated in the rally. So Dr. Spann's name is not on there, but he is one of the ones who is a part of this case. So as a preservationist, we find ourselves in a situation where we are talking about history, interpreting history, and encouraging uh, the public to interpret history as well. Another house that I worked on uh, or assisted in the work was helping these ladies, um, the Barber sisters, and they're standing in front of the Harriet Barber house, which was in their family um, for decades. And once the Majesca Simpkins house was completed, uh, they came to me asking about how we got our project off the ground, how we got it funded, and, um, and so on. So I was able to pass on the information that I received about putting the house on the register and um, creating a, a plan to preserve it and working with our municipal and our state organizations uh, in order to do that. And they were successful in preserving that site. And this is a picture of the Harriet Barber house here. It's in Lower Richland, um, 
County, South Carolina. And here's another picture of the site here. Um, it is also on the National Register. And it is also a site that represents Black women. And there are very few sites in the United States that represent the history of Black women. Now, this is a picture of myself and one of the uh, relatives of the Clarendon County um, cases that was involved in Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, we're standing in front of the Majeska Simpkins house. This is the project that I worked on with a team of people that we called ourselves the uh, Collaborative for Community Trust. Uh, we worked on this building for about a decade um, because there really is never, and those of you who are in preservation, you know that it's a, there's often not a lot of money um, available um, to do this work and it's spread out among the number of people who are uh, trying to get this work done. So it did take us a number of years uh, to get this done. Uh, but after a decade, we were able to do it and open the house. Um, eventually, that house became part of Historic Columbia, and that was a way for it to also receive an annual, um, uh, become an annual line item in the city's budget, uh, which helped it to uh, have the longevity that it has now. But at the time that we were working on this, there were very few sites nationally that were connected with African-American women. Um, so it, it accomplished a couple of things that I think are important. One, uh, it made sure that the Majeska Simpkins house was a part of the community. Um, it helped to make sure that she was not forgotten. We know the story of uh, hidden figures. Uh, so there's so many hidden figures in history and it would have been very easy for Majeska Simpkins to become one of those hidden figures who eventually fades into the background um, and is forgotten altogether except by uh, scholars. But because the house was preserved, not only was Majeska remembered by the public, but she was also um, became the subject of additional study by scholars. And I'm sure the scholarship probably increased um, 50 fold, 100 fold after the house opened and people were able to um, be reminded that she was there. So we filled in that part of the history and made sure that people were able to recognize the role that a woman had uh, in, in civil rights in South Carolina. And one of the people who uh, made regular appearances and stayed uh, on the Simpkins property was Thurgood Marshall, uh, who was coming to South Carolina because at the time, uh, civil rights leaders, NAACP, we're looking for cases, um, for, for uh, opportunities to try cases in education and civil rights, uh, looking for plaintiffs who might be willing to go the next level up to the Supreme Court. This is where uh, the Brown versus Board of Education case, um, which included a case from South Carolina and a case from several other states, to move forward um, uh, being able to address the issue of school desegregation. So Majeska Simpkins was very much a part of that case and having the house there made it possible for us to tell that part of the story. Another site that is important is the um, Man Simon site. And this is one of the first houses um, connected to an African-American that was uh, recognized by the growing African-American, by the growing historic preservation community at the time. And I think most of this movement started 
in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, this is C.C. Byers Johnson, and she was the museum interpreter of the C.C. Byers, um, of the um, Mann Simon, Cecilia Mann um, house uh, that she's standing in front of. So this is, uh, this is again, C.C. Byers Johnson. Uh, she helped put on what was called the Jubilee Festival of Heritage, uh, which is actually still carried on today, many years later by Historic Columbia. The house became a center for preservation of culture and history and doing this not only through the house, but through the festival. So again, we're seeking ways to preserve that history and culture um, to create a, a center for black thought, black culture, black history. Uh, and, and she was able to uh, do that so that it continues today. And here's another picture of her as, as one of the people who thought in an activist mode so we have three stories that we talked about of three particular civil rights sites, all sites connected to women, the Majeska Simpkins site, the Celia Mann site, and the Harriet Barber site. And all of those sites had black women who were behind those sites, making sure that they came to fruition. Okay. All right, so I'm going to turn my screen off. And from there, I, I want to re-emphasize the importance of that, of these sites that were led, their preservation was led by African American women. One site I led one site, uh, C. Tobias Johnson was a big part of that, and another site, the Barber Sisters were a part of it. So it turns out that decades later, the research showed that Richland County, the county in South Carolina that these three sites are in, had the most African-American women connected to historic sites in the country. So no other county in the US had more historic preservation sites that were connected to black women than this county did. And, and these are only you know three sites. There are more, uh, more added to that now. Uh, some of the sites have uh, markers added to them. They've had uh, some of the sites have street sign, street signage that has been changed and updated to reflect uh, the names of these women. Uh, there are other activities that have been happening, but these three sites made it possible for that recognition to, to take place. So that leads us to a particular challenge today because now we are, we are in a contest of and a challenge with regard to what we will preserve, what we will talk about, how we will talk about it, and whether or not our, our governments, our, our state government, you know, not just our school board, which has some, some engagement over what is talked about in the schools, certainly. But now we have our state, which is picking up this challenge from other states to look at and identify uh, a certain set of preservation um, materials in a classroom, certain number of presentation materials in a classroom and say, uh, these are going to be banned. The books are going to be banned. The 
the uh, discussions are going to be banned and the materials are going to be banned. So we, we do have a challenge. How are we going to, and, and possibly those of us in the preservation field think those challenges don't have anything to do with us because you know we're, we're not in the classroom. We are in the community doing this preservation work. Um, however, my book has found itself in a number of libraries uh, across the country. Um, you know, certainly a lot of spots where it's not there, but it's in a number of schools. It's, it's um, in the public libraries and some of the college libraries. So that leads me to wonder, well, what would happen if someone, if one of the teachers brought my book into a classroom and we're talking about these, these themes, would, would these themes be allowed? Uh, according to whatever law is proposed to be passed. Um, and, and my themes are talking about, you know, the title of the book, being good, building good, doing good. So I have not, um, I have not shied away from the idea of presenting uh, specific ideological ideas or social challenges or uh, civil rights um, uh, activity. I have not shied away from that in my book and connecting that to history. But it's certainly not an indoctrination. It's not a, um, it's certainly not something that's going to uh, force any any um, particular belief on any person, you know, be there, be they teacher or student. Um, but it is a part of the discussion, I think, to say, do we, do we want to make this connection between preserving these buildings and a connection to activism? I say in many cases, the connection is there. Um, you might see that in um, many kinds of history that have not been included in the past. Um, Native American history, um, we're now in the past few years doing uh, uh, more research into sites of LGBTQI history. So that is also a part of activism and education. So I, I, so I believe that one of the reasons why my book was recognized is because of this connection um, to education and history. And because it said that there is a significant role for his, historic sites to play uh, in encouraging people in the value of their own history in diversifying um, what we know about what happened in our community and how it happened. And also giving courage to people who are on the path of becoming civically engaged. They will be able to see other people they'll be able to see other people and be encouraged by the fact that those others were engaged even at a time when things were more difficult than they are today. And that may lead some people to feel like they have some hope in moving forward certain pieces of the, the civil rights agenda. So I do hope that there's some, there's some ongoing dialogue about the positive aspects of making a connection between um, studying our history and civic engagement and activism. I think that's not a, a, a negative thing and we have to figure out how to negotiate that. That 
sometimes it may be the case. It may not always be the case, but that will be a part of the dialogue and is certainly part of the dialogue uh, in my book. Uh, finally, because I, I, I do want to have a little time for us to engage as well. Um, I did want to focus on how our project with the um, with healthcare, with our communities for immunity project, which was the top, the project that we did here was the top uh, funded project in the country. And we were able to bring museum work and preservation work, the preservation story in our case, specifically of Dr. Cyril Spann, we brought his story in as a way to talk about these civil rights heroes. And uh, he was a civil rights hero, but he was also a medical hero and how did these medical heroes during a time of desegregation you know of segregation desegregation and integration which was the time period that dr cyril span was active how did he move through the challenges of those times how did he what did he use to overcome so we talked about perseverance, we talked about science uh, as the way that they overcame during that time. And we use that to share with people who are now having to reckon with COVID and the pandemic and needed to have a positive approach to, uh, to the the um, options that are available to them, to the healthcare options that are available to them and to the vaccine options that were available to them. So one way we did that was we had three artists to come in and do depictions of Dr. Cyril Spann, uh, a partner that he worked with in King Street, South Carolina, Dr. Joseph Mason. And we also talked about a Black physician in Columbia named Dr. Matilda Evans. So these three physicians were held up as examples of Black medical professionals who had victory over the obstacles of their day and used that example uh, for, for today. And the work the information about Dr. Spann was information that I uncovered in the process of uh, learning about him, learning about uh, doing research about the um, medical office and putting that building on the National Register. Uh, so it's now also been added to the uh, Wikipedia. So you'll be able to uh, go to the Wikipedia page and I'll probably bring that up um, a little later for you to see that page or at least be able to get to that link. Um, but that is another example of museums, preservation work and civic engagement and a form of activism in civic engagement um, in, in the current issues of the day and how those connections can be made very strong. So I think I'm gonna stop there, Katie and um, begin to engage with questions and, uh, and hear what folks have to say from there. Okay, thank you so much, Catherine. And I can't tell uh, whether people are seeing me on screen, but if you can see me on screen, I, I will can assume see you. Yes. people can. Okay, good. Um, well, first off, I really wanna thank you for the book and for your talk. Uh, the book, I know you finished a few years ago, so it was great to hear in your talk how you have continued that work right up to the present. I mean, I think the stuff about the pandemic is fascinating, how you found a connection between preservation and history and the pandemic that's just, really, really fascinating. Um, and it's all just helped really broaden my thinking about what preservation is and what it can be, um, bringing in that idea that the very act of 
fighting for the preservation of sites associated with civil rights and uh, other civil, uh, social movements is in itself an act of social justice and activism and that these sites yes. have an opportunity and an obligation going forward, not just to kind of teach us about what happened in a particular place at a particular time, but also uh, an opportunity to continue that social justice work itself. So it really just helped me make so many different connections and think in a, a much broader way that I hadn't before. So um, if people have questions, please do put those in the Q&A. But in the meantime, I have some to get us started. So I'm, I'm okay. happy, <laughs> happy if I get to ask some of them. Um, first of all, uh, what do you think is the value that either you get out of or other people might get out of physically being in these spaces and kind of interacting with them in person as opposed to watching documentaries about the civil rights movement or reading about the events? What is actually tangibly being in that space um, do that that those other forms of engagement don't? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful question. I'll, I'll say a couple of things about that. One is that some of us feel a spirit when we walk into these buildings. And I know that when I go into the Majeska Simpkins site, I feel that spirit very strongly. But I also have read in um, a work that Dr. Manning Marable did, where he talked about um, the, Malcolm, the, the Malcolm X site and he also talked about, um, no, the Malcolm X site was the one he went in. He talked about having the same experience. And Rob Reiner, who did the film about um, Mississippi, um, also had a chance to go into um, the, the house there in Jackson, Mississippi. And he talked about having that same experience. So certainly, I mean, when you go into um, the White House, and you think of all the other presidents that have been there and all these things that have happened, um, you, you have that sort of feeling. And I think in these civil rights buildings, you have a, a feeling there that is an encouragement to those of us who are, are working in the trenches, so to speak. I think that part of it, actually physically going there is important. But again, having the physical structure present is, is similar to the monument question. People say, well, um, having a monument suggests something to people because of the energy and money and resources and research that it took to put that monument in place. You know, that, that means that there's some importance attached to that that other people will pick up on. The same for this house. Again, so much multiplication of research that happened where people said, oh, well, who is this Majeska Simpkins? We need to do more research on her. We need to publish more books. We need more articles on her. And you started to see that happening. Um, so certainly people will, some people will connect in a emotional uh, sensitive, sensitive kind of way, but there's also the tangible sense of other things that are produced because this building that is there, that is there, is taking space and um, making it impossible for that person to be ignored. Mm -hmm. um, another kind of space that you talk about in the in the book is the Selma to Montgomery Trail. Yes. And I loved, I especially loved in the book, the photos of the march, I think because usually you see them in black and white and yours are in color, which we can talk yes. about that in a minute too. But that made it just seem so immediate and real, like instead of seeming like something that happened a long time ago, it looked more like something that could happen now. Um, but what I wanted to ask about that uh, particular site is that it's, it's such a huge and complicated space if you're thinking about the whole trail. And you know, you say in the book, nothing is permanent except impermanence. There's no way to freeze that in time. Uh, there's lots of different owners of the buildings along the trail. There's landscapes, there's structures, all kinds of things. So what is your vision of how a site like that can or should be preserved and how a site like that can be a space of social justice work going forward, given that it's not gonna be exactly how it was at the time? 
Well, well, that's that's true, and I think that um, the work that was done to produce this list of sites and to make that in the tr into a trail involved scholars, but it also involved the public. It involved people like John Lewis, uh, the the late John Lewis, all working together to create a um, common understanding of what they wanted those sites to, to represent and reflect. And I think that produced some strength that will continue to um, add um, a sense of, okay, these are things that we have to continue to invest in. Um, we do have the history of what happened there. We can continue to do more research and expand. Um, and they added several layers of protection uh, now the, the park service layer. So they have federal protection to keep it from uh, changing too much. But I think it was the, the critical multiple layers of engagement that produced that, that is the important thing to, um, to focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that sounds like another example where the preservation process itself is meaningful and you know creating those partnerships and engagement. Yes, yes, very much so. And that's that's what should happen more. Um, one thing about these sites is that oftentimes they're going to be off the radar because if the people who are in the preservation field are not looking in a certain direction, certain things will be lost. <laughs> you know, so that's why the stories of doing this were important. You know, I, I happened to be pulled into the Majeska Simkin situation and saw that nothing was being done uh, that had worked to preserve it. And so we organized ourselves in order to preserve it. The Malcolm X um, site, um, which is the, um, the Audubon Ballroom, the description of that was, well, you know, people didn't really uh, get into it and then they found, until they found out that Columbia University was going to knock it down. And then people responded from there. Um, but that building was vacant for a number of years. Um, the Lorraine Motel was on the verge of, of, you know, being auctioned off and just destroyed. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. But there was part of it was because people were reluctant to face the history. They want the history to go away, you know, which should not sound unfamiliar today. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, there are people who just don't want to deal with it or we're done with that and we kind of move on. So, so yes, we, we um, are able to see in these different stories how people were able to, um, what it took for people to overcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that reminds me of something else you talk about in the book, too, um, which is that sometimes, and we hear this in all aspects of preservation, but that there's sometimes opposition to the preservation of these sites because the feeling is that money could be spent on something else, maybe, you know, directly, in, you know, giving it to community service organizations that address those current needs. So um, how do you respond to that, that, you know, we shouldn't, we should, rather than preserving the site, we should donate the money to a, a group that is doing the work? Sure. Well, you know, I, I heard that very thing when I was working on the Majeska Simpkins house, you know, it took us, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to get where we got to uh, and, and more is being poured into it now. But I, I think that now we are realizing the importance of these different modes of preserving history now that, you know, things are, are under challenge and under threat. Um, we're realizing that the preservation part of it is a, a critical space, you know, in tandem with um, the research that's being done, academic research, um, the books that people are writing, the films that people are making about history and so forth. But the physical sites are uh, something so critical to people actually uh, having a certain kind of experience and understanding what your community was like. 
Um, and I, I, I recently went to um, the city of Abbeville here in South Carolina. And, you know, they, they, they're downtown. They've really done a fine job of producing and preserving their buildings. Um, but they've also added, there's a set of plaques that talk about lynching. Uh, from the uh, Equal Justice uh, Initiative that um, Byron Stevenson did. So we're, we're seeing this, not only um, the preservation of the buildings and what people thought was important, but we're seeing how that has changed over time, which is, which is a, a critical lesson to us in terms of how we uh, have to continue to change as well, change and adapt and pivot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question that came in in the Q&A, which is, uh, what are your thoughts about the preservation of homes of Black cultural icons, such as the childhood home of Nina Simone, the Long Island home of John and Alice Cotrain, et cetera? So sites that aren't necessarily attached to their activist work or that what they accomplished as an adult, but their childhood homes. Right. Yes. Yes. Those are all, all critical as well. And you know, these different, you know, the Harlem Renaissance and these different facets of our history um, are all complementary and all, you know, tell a complete story when put together. So if you don't have those pieces, you don't have the whole story uh, in any case. So yes, I, I have high regard um, for preservation of those different aspects of, of Black history. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one. Um, something else I was struck with uh, throughout the book is that um, your vision of what these historic sites associated with civil rights and other social movements can be can be doing is so much more broad than a typical house museum where you kind of freeze a site in time that, you know, they're continuing the social justice work. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like you talked about the feeling of going into some of these sites, there is that aspect of them being sacred sites for their association with historic people or events. So have you ever seen those be in tension where maybe there's some people who wanna see something preserved kind of exactly the way it was as a shrine to the person who lived there, but others say, no, this site would be better if we could change it more and, and adapt it to more of, you know, to make it easier to do the social justice work from there or something? Or do you see those as really being not in conflict so much? Uh, well, I think they're probably going to be more in conflict um, today, certainly, um, because of uh, the conversation that we're having. Um, there are also going to be conflicts because of the ownership and the funding mechanisms that the sites use. Um, if they're a nonprofit, you know, how much can they do, uh, of course, has um, boundaries around it. Um, but certainly people can come and meet and do certain things within the hall, uh, which are open, you know, to, to anyone who might want to meet there. So I, I, did, I did have an uh, experience where I had a conversation with um, Diane Nash, who was one of the, um, uh, from, from, from Memphis and one of the activists in SNCC, um, still, still with us now. And I was so honored to speak with her and tell her about this, this book that I'm writing, the preservation work and you know, preserving uh, civil rights. And she was just kind of nonchalant about it. And she said, well, you know, most of those sites are, are the money that's coming from those sites are not going back to help the black communities that they're about. They're going to other groups of people, you know, people come in and get a salary and that money is going away. And it's like, oh, I, I never really, I hadn't thought about that aspect of it. So I'm interested in looking at how there can be a restorative part um, economically of these sites and how, you know, and that's a very difficult question because, you know, there's not that much money for preservation to begin with <laughs> actually. So how to make that work. But I think we do need to look at how to make sure that some of the benefits are broadly spread and not narrowly spread. Mm -hmm. 
do you think, because um, we talk a lot about intangible history and, and um, ways of thinking about preservation of, of maybe someplace that's been radically altered or even demolished. So do you think a site of a, let's say a civil rights um, event or figure that has been very much changed or even demolished can still um, have the power to do the kind of good work that you talk about in the book? Yeah, that's that's a that's a question, and there is uh, a lot of challenge to um, both the National um, um, Register of Historic Places uh, guidelines, um, the Department of the Interior guidelines, the city and county local guidelines that people have, and how they might. Um, not be as inclusive of these kind of sites as they should be. So I think there is, um, well, you know, part of me would say we do want to include these sites that have not been um, well preserved or kept up. Another part of me would say, I would like to see them getting the funding that they need. You know, I would, I, I enjoy markers, but there's nothing I hate more than a marker and there's nothing. <laughs> a marker mm -hmm. in a parking lot, you know, it's just like, oh, I, mm. you know, so those of us who are preservationists, we, we really would rather see the building there than, than see yeah. an empty lot. So um, I think I'm more willing to make sure that the site is preserved, but I do think we need to have consciousness about what we can save of, of what is left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that there may still be some opportunities. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, I know you your book is self-published, and yes. I, so I wondered if you might want to talk about some of the advantages that that gave you in terms of freedom or flexibility to tell your story the way you wanted to do it and include what you wanted to. Right. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I did um, have some conversations with some university presses about doing this, and I came away with the idea that, you know, I didn't want it to be one of those academic books that, you know, <laughs> you know what happens to academic books. There's a very small uh, committee, community of people who read them. And, you know, I, I wanted something um, broader. I wanted something that people could, um, could understand. So um, for instance, doing this this way allowed me to um, not have to do footnotes. All, or 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 in notes, although I, I put them in just in a, a, a way that people wouldn't look at this and say, oh no, that's scholarly, I'm not reading that. Mm -hmm. um, so I was free to do that. I was free to put as many photos in as I wanted. So I think there's like 177 photos in there. Uh, some I took, some are archival, some I bought from you know these, these services. Um, some were from other sources. Um, so I was able to put in as many of those as I wanted. Now the trouble with that is, uh, and the book is also in full color. So that means, you know, if you're looking at a price point for a book, it's, you know, it's not in any price point. <laughs> so um, I wanted to be able to say, okay, well, you know, the book is here, you can get it from the library and you can read it for free you know, if the price point is too high, um, but it enabled me to, um, to do a kind of work that would be approachable that anyone could read. Uh, and it allowed me to make the book look the way I wanted it to look. Uh, I did have some challenges in um, doing the second edition and, you know, um, there were some changes in the industry of self-publishing and so forth. <laughs> so that created a little, a little challenge there. Um, but yes, I think I had a very positive experience um, in doing it in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, like I mentioned, the color photos really do. I mean, it's just so striking to see the, the, the march in color. I mean, that just, um, it's, that was what really struck me going through it. And then, and then the photos, um, of the, the reenactments when they were doing the film Selma. I thought that was so interesting too, to kind of think of how 
the the fact that this place is still there means it can it can be used in that kind of a way for all kinds of purposes. And and I know you mentioned that as reenactments and and film and television um, as a form of preservation or education yes. as well. Yes. And um, the picture that I have of Malcolm X on the stage, you know, that was also, you know, I, I started with about four or five pictures um, that were from the Schomburg and all of them had, you know, different people you had to get permissions from and so forth. So finally whittle it down to that one picture, you know, after, you know, talking to family members and, you know, the owners and so forth. Um, but I wanted a picture of him on the stage of that of that um, Audubon Ballroom. So very few um, pictures like that. But then that was the same stage that Denzel Washington stood on when he was making the film. And I think uh, that portion of the building might not be there anymore. So uh, that was able to kind of preserve that that portion of the building. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that you'll um, that you'll do a follow up book. I know you mentioned second edition. I was just looking to see which edition I have. I'm not sure, but um, to think about you know the the events of the last several years and like you mentioned, like the the fact that this whole issue of what's being taught in school is so big right now. I think that you know this that there's a lot of um, you know a lot of space to continue that that story and. Uh, and talk, you know, you talk about Black Lives Matter sites in the book mm -hmm. too, and obviously that's just been been huge. That could be a whole book in and of itself. It seems like because that's a form of memory that's so uh, talking about impermanence. You know that it's going to change yeah. and should change, and well, it's just so many interesting themes that that you touch on that I think are you know so relevant and increasingly relevant as time goes on. Yes, well, thank you so much for, for uh, letting me talk about this. And I was glad that it got the reception that it's gotten. And, you know, I've, I've had a number of talks over the past year, you know, California and Colorado and Providence, Rhode Island, and, and, and now New York. So I'm, you know, very um, honored that so many people have shown an interest in the book and that it's doing what it's set out to do. Uh, which is to to raise these aspects of it, and yes, we can continue to have that discussion as the environment changes and how we have to continue to defend that connection between mm -hmm. history and preservation and activism. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you both so much. I feel like that was kind of like a perfect encapsulation to end it off. So, uh, thank thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Katie. Um, and thank you for, for being part of this, you know, our preservation book club. And I think especially timely in Women's History Month, I, I love the focus on African-American women who are doing this work. I feel like they're not celebrated enough and you are celebrating them and you should be celebrated too. So thank you for being part of this and telling your story um, and continuing to do these grassroots campa campaigns. I think it's, we need more people who are willing to just like, E boots on the ground and I love to see it. So thank you. Um, and if anyone out there hasn't read the book yet, I definitely recommend it. And as Katie said, we, we hope you do a follow up because you know preservation and civil rights is an important topic to keep talking about and it's gonna keep evolving and growing and you know, your voice is important. So thank you for your work. Thank you um, so much for having as me. As I mentioned at the beginning, this uh, was recorded. So feel free to posted around if you enjoyed Catherine's talk as much as I did. Um, Catherine, thank you for being with us. Katie, thank you for the conversation. Um, and I hope you all tune in for another league program soon. And uh, you can go to our website, preserveNYS.org to find out what we're doing. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>